How many knows he's a wonderful Savior? I'm going to read a few scriptures tonight. Today is resurrection morning, so nobody ever taught me how to preach a traditional Easter message, so I'm going to give my best shot. I'm going to tell a little bit about Jesus tonight. And uh, I'm going to be reading a lot of scriptures, so if you need the scriptures afterwards, they'll be on the screen. He'll give them to you if you can't follow along with me. I'm going to start at Isaiah, the ninth chapter. Sixth verse, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. How many knows who that is tonight? That's that man in the middle. And it goes on the tale over in Matthew, the first chapter. It says, you know, Joseph, he was worried about his wife becoming pregnant. So he was willing to take her and keep her, the shame off of her. And an angel appeared unto Joseph, and it's what the angel said. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Next scripture, the 21st verse says, And she shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. How many knows he had a specific job when he came into existence? He had a specific job when he was spoken to existence. And how many knows the angel, the Holy Ghost, overshadowed Mary, and she brought forth the son, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. How many has got the Prince of Peace living on the inside of him? He shall save the people, his people, from their sins. And I like this in 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, it says, it's talking about God, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we may be free, that we may be, that we might be made the righteousness of, of God in him. That means God made him sin for you and I. He didn't commit sin, and there was no sin found in him, neither was a gal found in his mouth. But how many knows he had a specific duty when he was called to this earth, and it was to take the world's sin and put him on his shoulder and defeat him at Calvary. Amen. Somebody tell me his name. Wonderful. Amen. Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And they shall bring forth, Mary shall bring forth a son, and they shall, they shall call his name Jesus. Amen. And God put the sins of the world upon his shoulder, which knew no sin, but he took him upon himself. Matthew 26, verse 26, chapter. Jesus is talking about eating of the bread and drinking of the blood. And he said, and take this cup and give thanks and gave it to them saying, drink you of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which I shed for many for the remission of sins. How many knows the blood had to be shed for the remission of our sins? He had a specific job, Brother Carmen, when he came on this earth, and that was to take the world's sins and defeat them at Calvary. He said he nailed them to the cross. Yeah. And this leads us up to the point. You know, when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, how many knows he healed the blind? Yeah. He raised the dead. He casted out demons. He done all these great, mighty, wonderful works. He, when, he, when the one, the widow woman had a funeral possession, her only son died, and he was moved by compassion, and he went down to that funeral possession, and he said, hold it, and he raised that boy from the dead. How many knows he done his work while he was here, but his specific job to come up on this earth was to be a mediator between man and God. 
Because sin came in the garden and it divided man and God. They walked in harmony. They walked in peace. But when he, they partook of the fruit and when Jesus came down in the cool of the day and they hid themselves and, they, and, and God asked them, said, why have you hid yourself? Because we are naked. He said, how do you know you're naked? Because you eat of the fruit that I've forbidden you to eat. And you know what it did? It cast them out of the garden and it put a divide between man and God. But how many knows therefore there came forth a son and his name was called Jesus and he was the bridge that got that breath, that, that gap between man and God, how many knows he came to bridge it back? And it brings us up. How many knows he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he opened the eyes of the blind, he done all these great, mighty, wonderful things while he was here. But how many knows it was once appointed unto him to die? And it brings us up to this point. I'm trying to make a long message fast enough. But it brings us up to this point. Matthew 27. Child. You know, it come Jesus' time to die. And he went to the garden and he prayed to his sweat became as great drops of blood. And there was one that betrayed him. His name was Judas. For 30 pieces of silver, he kissed the Savior on the jaw and he betrayed him. And after he did that, how many knows he felt guilty and he didn't want that money. And he took it back to the council and gave it back to them. They didn't even want that money because it was a price of blood. And they went and buried in the pot in the in the field, the field of blood. How many knows even the sinner folks did not want nothing to do with that blood? Blood. Blood. And they brought him to Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. They had a man named Barabbas. He was a murderer. He was a mean guy. And it came time to release one of the prisoners and, and prisoners. And he asked the people, said, Who shall I release unto you? This man called Jesus or this man called Barabbas? And they said, Let us have Barabbas and crucify Jesus. I mean, that was a story. And the people wanted to ha have him killed. And they said, Crucify Jesus. And he said, you know what? Pilate said, I'm going to wash my hands with it. I have nothing to do with this innocent man's blood. And this is what the people said in Matthew 27th chapter and 27th, 25th verse. And then all the then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. How many knows they were speaking something they didn't know what they was actually speaking, but he came to put his blood on those people. And Jesus had that sin upon him. God put sin on him for us to defeat it in the flesh. A little tired of here. Huh? Somebody say hallelujah. I'm going to preach anyway. I'm going to preach what God gave me. How many knows he put sin on him that knew not sin for you and I so we could make heaven our home one day. But he had to take on the sins of the whole world. And because God had put sin on him in that moment in time. I mean, let me, don't let me get ahead of myself. But the people answered, all the people answered and said, let the blood be on us and our children. How many knows the devil thought he won? But the very thing that they spoke out of their mouth was the very thing it was going to take to get them to heaven. It was the shedding of the blood of the Messiah. It was the shedding of blood of Jesus Christ. And that was the only way that we could make it to heaven. So they was bragging about something. They didn't know what they was bragging about. The devil thought he had won because they wanted his blood on them. I want his blood on me too. Right. Let me know the story how Jesus died. We'll just take it through in a few minutes. They took him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. <coughs> they planted a crown of thorns and placed it upon his head. They put a reed, which is a stalk in his, or, or a limb or something, in his right hand. They bowed their knee and said, Oh, hell, king of Jews, mocking and making fun of him. They spit upon him. And they took the reed and smote him upon the head. Then they took the robe off. 
and put his own clothes back on him. Stripped him down. Humiliated him in front of everybody. Then they led him to be crucified. He went up to the place of Golgotha, which is called the place of skull. And I like this part here. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with God. How many knows what that really actually means? Gall was something that they would give the people that was crucified to take the sting off of it a little bit. It was a custom to give them something, which it was something bitter, but it was made from the plants and it was something to take. It would kill you anyway, but it was meant to take the intensity of your crucifixion off. And Jesus, when he found out what it was, he didn't want no part of it because he wanted to suffer what his punishment was upon the cross and he didn't need no help. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that. He realized what he was fixing to drink was a courtesy to him to try to help him take the sting off of what he was fixing to face. But when Jesus found out what he was fixing to drink, he didn't want no part of it because he wanted to face the full consequences upon Calvary's hill for you and I. And this is the point in time when he was on that cross. It was about the night there. He was hanging there between two thieves. And he cried out to the Father. He said, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? The Father had to look away from him, Brother Jim, because he was taking the sins upon this, upon the, uh, he was taking the sins of the whole world upon him at that moment in time. And I believe the Father had to look away because he put sin on him for us who knew no sin. And that moment in time, how many knows Jesus Christ became the worst, vilest sinner that he could become? He became a homosexual. He became a, a child molester. He became a rapist. He became the scum of the earth. He did not commit the sin. But how many knows he took the sin upon him and he defeated him cowards how many knows you can't get too low that God can't reach you? You can't get too far down that God can't reach down and pick you up out of the miry clay and put your foot upon the rock. How many knows why? Because He took the sins on Calvary's tree for you and I, the sins of the whole world. In that moment in time, He took some. Corruption upon him. In that moment in time, how many of the devil was standing back laughing and they was mocking him and saying, Oh, hell to the king of Jews. How many of they were spitting upon him? They were pushed piercing his side. How many of they rolled the nails in his hands? They thought they won. They started bragging about wanting his blood upon him, them and their children. They didn't realize what they was talking about. How many of the blood is a good thing? The blood is what it's going to take to get us to heaven. He had a job to do while he was here. He had a job to do. He took the sins of the whole world upon him. Right, <laughs> then he cried again with a loud voice and he gave up the ghost. I mean, knows the story. I didn't want to go through the whole thing. I, I know everybody knows it. He gave up the ghost, and the, and the ground shook, and the earthquake happened, and the rocks rent. And the Bible says the saints, the graves of the saints was opened up, and they was walking around after his resurrection. I wonder what happened while, for those three days that he was in the tomb. I'll tell you what happened. This is how much Jesus loved us. 1 Peter 3rd chapter said 18th verse it says for Christ also had suffered once for the for sin the just for the unjust that he might bring unto that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit and here's what Jesus did those three days by which also he went and preached 
unto the spirits in prison. How many knows everybody that died before Jesus Christ died on the cross? How many knows they died under the law? And if the law could get you to heaven, how many knows they would not be a reason for the Messiah to be brought into this earth to be dying for our sins? How many knows if, if John the Baptist could have made it to heaven without Jesus dying and going preaching to him while he was locked in prison? How many knows there wouldn't be a need for Jesus Christ to die on the cross? If it wasn't for Jesus Christ, where would John the Baptist be? John the Baptist was the he was one in the crying in the wilderness. He he's saying, prepare the way. He said, the one is coming after me whose shoelaces I ain't worthy to latch. How many knows if it hadn't been for Jesus when he died on the cross and they put him in that borrowed tomb for three days. But while he was there, he didn't stay in that tomb. How many knows he went to hell and he preached to the spirits locked in prison and he went and delivered the people that died that was under the law. That's awesome, man. He didn't just stay there. I believe if you read in the Bible over in Matthew, he said when Jesus gave up the ghost, he said there was a great earthquake, earthquake and the rocks rent and the saint, the graves of the saints was opened up and they were seen after his resurrection walking around. I believe they went with him and they had revival and Jesus had to save them under grace also. Because let me tell you something, without grace, you cannot make heaven your home. I know it's ain't a traditional Easter message, but I'm going to preach what the Lord gave me. If you die without grace, how many knows there's nothing you can do? You're going to bust hell wide open. And everybody that died before Jesus Christ died on the cross, how many knows they died under the law? And if the law could get you to heaven, then Christ died in vain. But what did Jesus do when brother brother James, when he was in that tomb? Did he stay there and rest for three days? Mm -mm. He went and preached to the spirits that was locked in prison. That's awesome, man. So you just tell yourself, if you think you can get by with grace, John the Baptist didn't get by without it. That's pretty tough, but it's right. Because without grace, it's not by works that we should that we're saved and we we should boast. It's not by works that we should boast that we're saved. But how many knows it's by grace? But you see, Jesus didn't stay in that tomb. He went and preached to the spirits locked in prison. And I like what he said right here in, in Revelations, the first chapter. He told John, this was after he was raised. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead. He said, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. How many knows he has the key to hell and to death? Jesus has the key to hell and to death. First Corinthians 15th chapter. I'm, I'm, I missed. I missed that, but I'm gonna get back to it. And it says, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith in vain also. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead raise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Yet are ye in your sins. 
How many knows if he hadn't raised up from the dead, you'd still be a sinner? If he hadn't raised from the dead on that resurrection morning, how many knows you'd still be living in your sin? If, you, if he hadn't raised on that resurrection morning, how many, how many knows you'd be on your way to hell? But how many knows he was raised on the third day? And over in Revelation, he said, I am he that liveth, that once was dead, but now I'm alive, and I have the keys to death, hell, and grave. I overcame them. Amen. I'm alive, he said. It says, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ perish. In other words, if Jesus was still dead in the tomb and I fell asleep in Christ, that would be the end of it. That would be it. I don't know about you, but I got a mama over in heaven. I got a dad and I'm going to meet in heaven. I got a brother I'm going to meet in heaven. I got a grandma. I got a grandpa. I got loved ones that's done went on before because Jesus made a way. He was resurrected from the dead and he has the key to hell and he has the key to the grave. And he knows because he was resurrected and he knows that he is alive because he is. That's why I am. But if Jesus hadn't raised from the dead, our faith would be in vain. And those that also went to our fallen asleep in Christ are perished. 19th verse says, Paul says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. How many of us? If Jesus had to resurrect it on that third glorious morning. How many of those, our loved ones that stunned one on before us, that would be the end of it. They wouldn't be resurrected. But he told them, he, over in, in Revelation, he was talking to John. He said, you know what? I have the keys to hell and the grave. Because he has risen, my faith is not in vain. But he, if he has been raised from the dead, how many knows our faith is in vain? I don't know about you, but my faith ain't in vain. I've been on this long journey a long time. I ain't tired yet. I went through many storms. I went through many battles. I went through many oppressors. But how many knows I'm still here? And God has saved me for a time such as this. I'm going to see the dead raised. I'm going to see the blinded eyes open. He said, the works I do shall you do also even greater works because I go to the Father. How many knows because he has been risen from the dead, I'm no longer a nobody. I'm a somebody. Yeah. And when I die, the Bible says to be absent from the body will be to be is to be present with the Lord. How many knows because he was resurrected on the third day? How many knows the dead will not perish, but they shall be called up to meet him in the moment and a twinkling of an eye. The corruptible shall put on incorruptible. This mortality shall put on immortality. I ain't got this on the screen, but I, if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, how many knows our faith would be in vain and the dead would perish? But he said, you know what? I am alive. I was once dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys to the kingdom. First Corinthians 15th chapter. This is where he gets this. He's talking about the dead when they called up and us that are alive and remain shall be called up to meet and we shall, the corruption shall put on incorruptible. 54th verse says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall the, be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh grave, where is thy victory? And I like this part. It says the sting of death is sin. And the strength of the sin is the law. How many knows? Oh death, where is thy sting? How many knows what? The sting of death is what? Sin. What did Jesus defeat on Calvary? Sin. 
So when I'm resurrected, I'm not going to be resurrected in sin. How many knows I'm going to be resurrected in a new life? I'm going to, the old man has passed away. Behold, all things become new. How many knows because he died and he was resurrected on that third glorious morning, how many knows he took the sting of death from him? He took sin out of the way. And you know what he did? He nailed it to his cross. Oh, great. Where is thy victory? I might die. I may go by the way of the grave, Brother James. But guess what? I'm not going to stay there when that last trumpet sounds because he went to Calvary's cross and he went in that borrowed tomb for three days. But on the third day, he was resurrected. How many knows because of that, how many knows I'm going to be called up to meet him in the air? And I can say, oh, death, where's thy victory? Oh, gra oh grave, where's thy victory? Oh, death, where's thy sting? How many knows I'm going to be called up to meet him in the air? Because he died on the cross. And he was resurrected on the third glorious morning. And this is the thing I like. After he did his duty. Over in Hebrews. Seventh chapter. 24th verse says. But this man. Because he continued forever hath an unchangeable priesthood. For, for he is able also to save them to the what? To the other ones. I like that, don't you? It don't matter how far down you are. It's a little quiet in here. That's all right. It don't matter if you're a homosexual. It don't matter if you're a child molester. It don't matter if you're a murderer. It don't matter if you're a drug addict. It don't matter what kind of uh, the depths of the hell that you've been in. How many knows he saves to the other one because he died on the cross and he took the sins of the whole world upon him and he defeated it on Calvary's tree. How many knows there's no sin too big that God can't handle except blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And how many knows he can reach down way below the bottom and he can change people's lives because he defeated sin. Where? On the cross. He took the victory out of death. Where? He took the sting out of death on the cross. That ought to get you excited. Because he can save to the uttermost. That come unto God by him sin. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. 26 verse says, For such a high priest became who? Us. Why did he become us? To take what upon him? Sins of who? Just a few people? Or just a, a, a little white lie? Just a little petty sins? You know those innocent sins? That's all the ones he took, right? How many did he take? All of them. No matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how grotaceous, or no matter how good looking they, those sins are. How many knows he took the sins of the whole world upon it? He did not commit the sins, but how many knows he took them on Calvary and he nailed them to the cross? And therefore, do you know what? He, he took the keys to the kingdom, he took the keys to death and hell. That's awesome, man. So now he's able to save just the goody two shoes. Now he's just able to save the ones that ain't done real big sins, right? He said he's able to save to the what? Uttermost. That's awesome, man. I wish y'all would get happy with me tonight. Brother Jim, my sins may not be big as yours, or your sins may not be big as mine, but how many knows if we give them to Jesus Christ, how many knows they're defeated by the blood? Without the blood, there's no remissions of sin, but how many knows he shed his blood for you and I? I don't know about you, but I've been bought by the price. I've been washed in his blood. I, hallelujah. How many knows I'm a changed creature because Jesus died on the cross? And if he had not been raised from the dead, how many knows my faith is in vain? But he said, I am alive. I'm the one that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And I took the keys to hell and the grave. Amen. That's awesome, man. Yeah. 
He said, For such a high priest became us, who is wholly harmless, undefiled, separate from sinner, and made higher than the heavens. He did not commit sin. But how many knows he defeated sin on Calvary? Right? First Peter, this is the last scripture. Second chapter. 24th verse. It says, Who's his own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. And I like this part here. By whose stripes ye were healed. In his own body. In other words, did Jesus just take a little white lie upon him? Did he just take a little still and a piece of bubble gum upon him? What kind of sin did he take upon him? In his own body. Sins of what? Of the world. Have you ever looked at somebody on the street, Brother Carmen, and they look so bad, they look so strung out on drugs, they look so strung out on alcohol, they live it in the streets and they just look like, they just, just hells eat them up. And you look at them and say, there's no hope for them. Have you ever got that feeling? I got news for you. There's hope for them people because he took those sins in his own body and he nailed them to the cross. He is now able to save to the uttermost. Why? Because we're not serving, serving a dead Savior. We're serving a risen Savior. If He's still in the tomb, how many knows our dead is going to perish? And if He's still in the tomb, how many knows our faith is in vain? But I don't know about you. My faith ain't in vain because I'm serving a Jesus Christ that's alive and well. I'm serving a Messiah that didn't stay in the tomb. How many knows He was resurrected after the third day? And He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And He's making intercession for us to the Father. Because He bare our sins in His own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. If He was still laying in that borrowed tomb and you needed something from Him, if you had a need in your body, have you noticed? You couldn't get healing for your body. How many believe he's resurrected? Amen. How many believe if you sit tonight, he's already took the stripes for our healing? Amen. If you need him tonight, how many knows he's already suffered the stripes for our healing? How many knows if you've got sin in your life, all you got to do is bring it to the feet of Jesus Christ, and he has forgiven you of your sins if you just ask forgiveness. Amen. How long does it take him to forgive you? Why? Because the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery, how long did it take him to forgive her of her sins? Why? Because he earned the right on Calvary's tree. Mary Magdalene that went and washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and dried it with her hair and, 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 and anointed his feet with the ointment. How many knows how long did it take him to forgive her of her sins? Which was many? And that was before he died and was resurrected. Now. that everybody that died before Jesus died under the law. If the law could save you, then Christ died in vain. How do you understand that? What did Jesus have to do to, to preserve the people that went on before him? He had to go preach to them in prison. That just means in confinement. 
That just means he went and delivered the people and set the captive free. Y'all quiet tonight. This is exactly me. I know that he bare my sins in his own body on the tree. And you know what, Brother Jim? Because he died and was in the tomb for three days, but on that third day he was resurrected. I know that because he lives, I can have my healing. Because he lives, when that last trumpet sounds, if I'm walking around on this earth, I'm going to be walking around corruptible, but I'm going to be called up to meet him, and I'm going to put off this corruptible and put on incorrupt incorruptible. I'm going to put off this mortal body and I'm going to put on immortality. I'm excited about it because I'm serving a risen Savior. How many serving a dead Savior? How many believe he's alive and well? How many's got a need in your body? Brother Jim, you know what's going to happen? It's coming to pass. Why? Because by his stripes you are what? Healed. You don't look at it right now. Well, you don't look like it. You know what? You walk by faith and not by sight. We don't see that arm the way it is. How many of we see it the way it's going to be? I don't look at my circumstances. I don't, you know, how many of those circumstances don't change God? God changes circumstances. It don't matter how big don't be. It doesn't matter how big my problem is. How many of my problem's not too big for God? Why? Because he saved two. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Brother, he saved us. But there's one thing that we must do. We must believe. If we don't believe in who we serve, then Christ died in man. But I don't know about you, but I will not frustrate the grace of God. I'm not going to try to get it on my own. Let me know. He's the one that paid the price. He's the one that died on the cross. He was the one that had the crown of thorns. He was the one that was stripped and beat and, and had to carry his cross up to God off the hill, the, the place called the Skull. I mean, was, he was the one that suffered the punishment for me. And I get a little down and out sometimes. I get the feeling sorry for myself. But I don't, I got to think about what Jesus went through. He did it for me. I got no reason to be down and out. I got no reason to be sad. I mean, I ought to be rejoicing in the Lord always because... Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. How did he set us free? He went to the grave, but he didn't stay there. Brother James, I got some loved ones that's out and seeing really, 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 really bad. But I got a Messiah because he died on the cross and was placed in the barn of the tomb. But on the third day, he was risen. Because if he didn't get raised from the dead, how many knows my preaching's in vain and my faith is in vain? But because he was raised on the third day, he was talking to John over there in Revelation. He said, I am he that is alive and once was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And I took the keys to the kingdom. I took the keys to death. I took the keys to hell. I'm alive. And because he's alive, I can have my healing. Because he's alive, I'm not going to hell. How many is, if you die tonight, where are you going to go? Heaven. Amen. Amen. How many is kind of worried about not going to heaven? If you're worried about not going to heaven, how many knows you need to get all? But if I die tonight, I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. It ain't no maybe. It ain't, it ain't no Lord. I hope so. I know where I'm spending my eternity because I've been bought with a price. I've been redeemed. How? By the blood of the Lamb. By His stripes. Ladies and gentlemen, ye were healed. Big standing feet. Is it like everybody's a little tired tonight? And it's harder to preach when people's tired, I'm telling you. 
But I get to thinking about, you know, I was a little tired myself, but I get to thinking about how tired Jesus was of dragging that old cross up that up that hill and he got so weak that he fell down and they had to to, to, to get somebody out of the crowd, Simeon, what that his name. They had to uh, 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 recruit him to help the master carry his cross. And because Jesus was very tired. He was beat. He was whipped. He was put on the crown of thorns. I mean, those days smote him on the head with a reed and they put above his cross making fun of him. Here's the king of Jews and they was mocking him and making fun of him. I mean, those Jesus was tired. And when they offered him vinegar and gall to drink, he refused it because it tasted bad for one thing. But I didn't even know this until I'd done a little research on it. Their custom over there in crucifixion was that it was some plant roots that would take the, the, the sting off of the crucifixion. He didn't want no part of that. How many knew that? I didn't know it either. But he didn't want no part of it. He wanted to take the sins and the full brunt of what he was fixing to face. How many believe Jesus was tired? How many gets tired sometimes? How many gets too tired to worship the Lord? When we get tired, sometimes we lose our excitement. How many knows? Then when we lose our excitement, we lose our joy. And when we lose our joy, guess what happens? We lose our When that tornado come across the field and it took my house and took everything I had and my kids were sta standing 70 foot away and not a scratch on them, that just happened a couple years ago. I, mean, was, I can't get too tired to praise my God. I can't get too tired to, to not worship Him because look what He's done for me. Brother Sam, you need a healing tonight? How many knows you can get it tonight? Anybody need prayer tonight? Make it to get us a song together. If you need prayer tonight. <laughs>